What a day for celebration. What a day to rejoice. The Spirit of God is in our midst. God has come to meet with us. So bring your hearts before Him. Worship Him in word and song and prayer. Be filled with hope and joy. We've got a God that loves us, knows us, wants to be with us. Let go of all your fears, all your worry, all your frustration. Let, let God have it all. For we are here. We are one. We are the body of Christ. Let us celebrate together this great and wonderful God of ours as we join together in our call to worship. As people of Christ, we seek to be the same mind as Christ. As people of Christ, we seek to have the same love as Christ. As people of Christ, we seek to be nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. As people of Christ, we seek to look to the interest of others. As people of Christ, we come together this morning to proclaim Jesus Christ is Lord. Let us worship joyfully. Let us pray. God of all truth, we come this morning longing for that peace that really only you can provide. So very often we are tossed to and fro, we are blown around by every wind except that wind of your spirit. We pray that you would be pleased to dwell with us here this day to receive our worship and our praise. So linger long and speak the truth to us in love so that we might come to the unity of faith and to the knowledge of the full stature of Christ. In whose name we pray this morning, amen.
Just out of curiosity this morning, see how up you are on your mathematical concepts, just how heavy would you say a glass of water is? Eight ounces. Okay, eight ounces. More? Okay, eight ounces, 20 ounces. So, you know, how much does a glass of water weigh? Well, did you know that the absolute weight of a glass of water, or really anything else for that matter, is kind of inconsequential. It really doesn't matter how much something weighs uh, as much as how long you hold it. Example, take an eight ounce glass of water, you hold it for a minute, it's really not much of a problem. If you hold it for an hour, well, it's still not really a problem, but your arm is likely to kind of start to ache. But if you hold it for a day, well, then your arm's going to start turning numb. It's going to get paralyzed. In each of these cases, the weight of the water in the glass does not change. It stands, it stays the same. So it is, it's how long you hold it. The longer you hold it, then really the heavier that it becomes. And it occurs to me that the stresses that we find ourselves experiencing in life, all the stressors, the worries, all those things are just like that glass of water. We think about them for a while and it's really not a problem, nothing really much happens. We think about those things and dwell on them for just a little bit longer and well, they uh, perhaps they begin to hurt just a little. But if you think about them all day, if you think about them all the time, if that's all you ever think about, then you become paralyzed. You're incapable of doing anything. And so that's one thing that our time of confession does for us. It brings us to a place where we can kind of set that glass of water down. We can take all those worries, all those stressors, all those anxieties and fears that we have, and we can let go of them. We can actually, we can set them down. All the things that we've done in the past, you know, one of our biggest problems that keeps us from moving forward, uh, not just in life, but in our spiritual growth as well, is the fact that we get so deeply rooted in the past that we can't move forward. So our challenge this morning is to let go of that, is to lay those things down as Jesus asks us to do. So let us do that as we join together in our prayer of confession. Oh, great God, we bring ourselves before you just as we are, broken, sinful, weak. We confess that we are fickle people, saying one thing, doing another. Forgive us, for we have sinned. We say that we want to follow you, but we turn around and walk the other way. We say that we love you, and yet we do not love our brothers and sisters. But you are gracious, compassionate, slow to anger. And for this, we humbly thank you. We know that you are here, ready to hear our prayer of confession and to help us to turn from our sinfulness. Again and again, you forgive. Thank you for not treating us as our sins deserve. For your love and forgiveness, we worship you now. Brothers and sisters, attend to these words that come to us out of the Gospel of John. God loved the world so much that he gave his only son so that everyone, anyone who believes, may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son in order to condemn the world, but rather so that the world through him might be saved. So hear this good news and believe. For in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, your sins are forgiven. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. God of great love, we confess that we very often fail to remember that no matter where it is we go, no matter what it is we do, that we are completely, totally, utterly surrounded by your love. We rush through our busy days. We find ourselves in prison by our schedules instead of letting those schedules free us up. We find ourselves in the throes of despair or in the midst of a very stormy time, and, and we tend to forget that 
even in the midst of the very worst things that can happen to us in our lives. Well, you're there too. So in the quiet of these moments, help us to be still and remember that you are God. And in the certainty of that great love that you have for us, we pray this morning for all of those who are ill, for those who care for them. We pray this morning for Ken, for Tammy, for Adrian and Carl, for uh, Sandy's family. We pray that these in their hearts would feel the support of your loving arms as they, as they try to maneuver through very difficult paths. We pray this morning for those who are serving in distant lands, those who are working and serving in harm's way. Let them know that you are eternally present with them. We pray for all of those that work for peace and who bring help to those who are in need and that their work would bring love and be an example of the great love that you have. Grant us the courage, Lord, to give into your hands all those burdens that we carry with us, all the resentments, all the anger, all the fear. Strip away from us <clears throat> all those things that rob us uh, of who we are, and uh, in their place let peace prevail. Free us, Lord, so that uh, we would uh, know the certainty of your care. And as we do so, we pray the prayer of your Son, Jesus the Christ, who walked this earth and triumphed over difficulties and pain and death. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I want to share in your hearing this morning, uh, reading from the book of Exodus, chapter 17, uh, verses 1 through 7. <clears throat> Directed by God, the whole company of Israel moved by stages from the wilderness of Shin, and they set up camp at Rephidim. Now, wasn't a drop of water for the people to drink anywhere, and so the people got on Moses' case. They said, give us some water to drink. But Moses said, why, why in the world are you pestering me? Why are you testing God? But the people were thirsty for water, and they complained to Moses. Why in the world did you take us out of Egypt, drag us all the way out here, our children, our animals, and everything else so that we could die of thirst? And Moses cried out to God in prayer to God. He said, what, what am I supposed to do with these people? Any minute now, they're going to kill me. And God said, well, just go on out ahead of the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel. Take that staff that you used to strike the Nile and go. And I am going to be present before you there in the rock at Horeb. You are to strike the rock, and water will gush out of it so that people will drink. Well, Moses did just exactly what the Lord said with the elders of Israel right there watching. And he named the place Massah, which means testing place, and Meribah, which means quarreling because of the quarreling of the Israelites and because of their testing God when they said, is God here with us or not? 
Our second reading is from the second chapter of Philippians, uh, verses 1 through 13. If you have gotten anything at all out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life at all, if uh, being in the community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with one another. Love one another. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside. Help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to, you know, to lend a helping hand. Think of yourselves the way Christ thought of himself. You see, he had equal status with God, but really didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status uh, no matter what. When the time came, he set aside all the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, becoming human, and having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death and the worst kind of death there is, a death by crucifixion. And because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honored him far beyond anyone or anything so that all created things in heaven and earth, even those that are long ago dead and buried, will bow and worship before this Jesus Christ and call out in praise that he is the master of all to the glorious honor of God the Father. Now what I'm getting at, friends, is this is that you should simply keep on doing what it is you've been doing from the beginning. And when I was living among you, you lived in responsive obedience. Now that I'm separated from you, keep it up. Better yet, redouble your efforts. Be energetic in your life of salvation. Reverent, sensitive before God. That energy is God's energy, an energy deep within you. God himself willing and working at what will give him the most pleasure.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we long to see you and know you. We don't dare pretend that we have all the answers for, I mean, how can we ever really fully understand your ways? As we look into the word today, help us to do it with a sense of humility. Uh, let us not dismiss the words because we've already heard them, but Open our hearts up to new words that are you going to speak to us today. We desire to be changed by you, and so use this scripture to challenge us, to teach us, to move us toward being more like your Son, in whose holy name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> the text for the message this morning is from 21st chapter of Matthew verses 23 through 32. And then Jesus was back in the temple and he was teaching and the high priests and leaders of the people came up and they demanded, said, you need to show us your credentials. We need to know who authorized you to teach here. And Jesus said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll match you query for query. I ask you, you ask me a question, I'll ask you a question. If you answer mine, then I will answer yours. This baptism of John, who authorized it? Was it heaven or humans? Well, they were in a bind and they knew it. See, they pulled back into a huddle and they started whispering among themselves and they, they said, well, you know, if we say it was heaven, then he'll say, why didn't you believe him? And if we say humans, then uh, we're up against it because all the people, they think that John is some great prophet. And so they decided that they would just concede that round to Jesus and they replied to him, said, well, we just don't know. Jesus said, well, then I won't answer your question either. Then tell me what you think about this story. There was a fellow who had two sons, and he goes up to the first, and he says, son, I want you to go out and work today in the vineyard. And the son said, I don't think I want to do that. 
But later on, he started thinking about it, and he thought better and went out. The father gave the same command to the second son, who answered, Sure, I'd be glad to do that, but he never went. So which of those two sons did what the father asked? And they said, Well, the first. And Jesus said, Yes, and I tell you that crooks and hookers are going to precede you into God's kingdom. John came to you showing you the right road. You, you just turned your noses up at him. But all those crooks and all those hookers, well, they believed him. And even when you saw their changed lives, you didn't care enough to change and believe him. The word of God for the people of God. <clears throat> those of you who have been sports followers for quite some time will recognize the name Vince Lombardi. He was one of the great pro football coaches back in the 1960s. And one of the things that uh, Vince Lombardi was very uh, fond of saying is that winners never quit and quitters never win. Now, those are profound words. They are stirring words, inspirational words, but they're also wrong. You see, really, one thing history shows us is that uh, winners usually quit one thing to move on to another thing. Example, go read the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew tells us that at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he quit Nazareth and moved to Capernaum, and that was sort of his home base, you see, for the beginning stages of his ministry. Simon, Peter, Andrew, they quit their fishing business so they could be followers of Jesus. Saul quit being a persecutor of uh, the early church and became an apostle of the early church. And I mean, even today, we have, uh, we have uh, winners who quit. I mean, Abraham Lincoln, for example. Abraham Lincoln quit being an owner of a general store and went into politics, and we know how that worked out for him. Julia Child stopped being a CIA intelligence officer and became a world-famous cook. Harrison Ford quit a, a professional carpenter career when he was offered a part in a little movie called Star Wars. And Grandma Moses, bless her little heart, quit selling potato chips and started painting when she was 80 years old. So quitting has always been kind of cool. And when you really think about it, our country was founded by quitters. They quit England, and they came here, and when they found out that uh, things were, uh, in many ways, not much different than living in England, they said, well, forget all this. We're, we're out of here. We're not putting up with this anymore. And then that's what inspired, you see, the Revolutionary War. Clearly, sometimes, quitters win. And they win when they discover that there is an upside to giving up. In this parable that Jesus tells about the two sons uh, that he shares with the chief priests and the, the elders, it's a story about two men, a man who had two sons, and he instructs both of them to go out and work in the vineyard. He says to the first one, says, son, I need you to go out and do thus and so you know, in the vineyard today. And, well, the son's got better things to do. He wants to go hang out with his friends. He wants to do this, that, and the other. So he tells his father, he says, no, I don't believe I'm going to do that. But, you know, sometimes we think about things that we say and how they affect other people. And he, he did that, and he started feeling kind of bad. And so he changed his mind. He quit what he was doing, and he went to do the work that his father asked him to do. And then the father goes and he asks the very same thing about the second son. He says, son, how about you going out work in the vineyard today? And the second son, well, he's just all gung-ho. He is just, ooh -ah, and he's ready to, you know, I'll go, I'll go. But then he just, you know, he gets doing something else and his attention gets uh, diverted and he never manages to show up. He didn't follow through. So Jesus asks, he says, which of these two sons did what the father asked? Which one was the real winner? Well, this is really kind of a no-brainer question when you think about it. And, and even the chief priests and the elders, they had to, they had to answer, well, well, it was the first son. Uh, duh! You see, they grasp that the son that quits what he's doing and goes to work in the vineyard is the real winner. 
in the story. So discovering exactly what it is that you need to do is the upside of being able to give up. Believe me when I say to you, and Jesus now is talking to the religious establishment of his day, crooks and hookers are going to get into the kingdom before you. Now that's pretty harsh language. Evidently, Jesus never read the book How to Win Friends and Influence People because you don't win a whole lot of friends by telling them that the crooks and hookers are better off than they are. And so the chief priests and the elders, they kind of, well, what? What are you talking about? Seriously? You mean folks like that are going to actually be winners? See, John came to you and he was preaching you, showing you the right road, but man, you just turned your nose up at it. But all those crooks, all those prostitutes, all those tax collectors, all those dregs of society, well, they, they heard what John was saying and they discovered exactly what they needed to do. But now what about all those chief priests and elders? Even when you saw how their lives were changed, you didn't care enough to change and believe. So these guys, these guys were so sure they were right. They were so sure that they were the winners, so sure that they didn't need to quit what they were doing, that they never were able to change their minds and hear and believe what Jesus had to say. More often than not, those who are willing to change are the ones that lead the way into the kingdom of heaven. So when do we, when do we come to that place when we can discern when it is time for us to give up? Well, here are three hints that I'm going to share with you this morning about how to know when it is time to quit. Hint number one. The time to quit is when your heart's just simply not in it anymore. Uh, the Atlantic Magazine uh, posted a story about Noah Berlatsky who talks about his son's experience in pursuing martial arts. He'd been doing it for a number of years and he had gained a, a certain amount of expertise in the field. He'd gotten to a place where he could uh, had a certain amount of ability being able to fight with nunchucks, with sticks. And so Berlatsky was a little bit surprised when his son came to him and informed him that at some point he says, you know, I'm going to get bored and definitely I'll quit. Berlaski decided that when his son reached that point that he was going to support him because he believed that quitting, quitting is one of the most important skills you can teach your child. Knowing when to quit is one of the most important skills that you can teach. It's an awful lot like a comedian, one of the, one of the most uh, important things to learn as a comedian or even as a preacher or speaker is when to get off the stage, when to quit. It's like the joke about the uh, fella was listening to the preacher. He'd been preaching for about an hour, and he just couldn't stand it anymore. And so he went outside, and there's another fella standing out there. And the guy looked at him and says, uh, uh, says is the preacher finished? And he says, oh, Lord, said he finished an hour ago. He said, he just ain't quit. <laughs> See, we, we have to, the biggest thing you can learn how to do is when to quit, you say. The only way that you can change your life, the only way that you can move on to something else is to quit what you're doing. Quit what you're doing and move on. And you know that it's time to quit when you discover that you'd be happier without martial arts or without whatever it is that you happen to be doing at a particular time. Discovering your true passion in life, that is the upside, you see, of giving up. Hint number two, you know it's time to quit when you just can't quite see your way forward. When Jesus went into the temple that day, the, the, the chief priests and the elders, they was laying for him, you know. They had the trap baited, and they were just, they were sitting on a hair trigger. They were ready. They were, they were loaded for bear. And so when he walks into the temple, immediately they jump his case, and they're going, we need to see your credentials. We need to see your preacher's license. We need to, we know, need to know who it is that has given you the authority to be able to teach here. Now, Mother Mary didn't raise no, no baby fools. And Jesus wasn't born yesterday, didn't fall off no truck truck. And so he knows immediately that they're trying to put him in a trap. 
And so he, he answers their question with a question. He says, this baptism about John the Baptist, he says, who authorized it? Was it heaven uh, that authorized it? Was it humans? Well, see, he was, that was a genius move, if ever there was one, because essentially what he did was he painted the, he, he painted the scribes and the Pharisees uh, into a corner. It was one of those questions that there was no way that they could answer it without getting in trouble, sort of like that perennial question, do you still beat your wife, you know? So they start arguing with one another only to discover that there's nowhere for them to go. There's no way forward. If we say that it was inspired by heaven, then they'll want to know, Jesus will want to know, why didn't you believe what he had to say? And if we say, well, it was from human origin, the people are going to get all all upset because they, well, they think that John's a prophet. And so, with a tremendous amount of angst, and you know, as it, it just galled them to the nth degree, they went to Jesus and kind of hung their heads and couldn't barely bring themselves to say the words, we don't know. We don't have the information available at, at present, so we're going to have to put together an exploratory committee and have hearings and committee meetings and then publish our findings in a peer review magazine, get ad- additional feedback. They just can't see any way forward. They know that they're going to get in trouble about the baptism of John uh, regardless of how they answer. So being stuck, which to you and I, to any rational, logical thinker, would lead us to the point, well, we either need to change the direction and uh, maybe think that Jesus is telling us something important here, but they don't do it. Instead of giving up, instead of changing course, they stay stuck, you see, on ground zero. Don't confuse me with the facts. What's real and what's true is what I perceive it to be, not what the facts say they are. So don't try to convince me that I'm wrong and that's my story and I'm sticking to it. In fact, they were so wed to that idea that they, it led them to the only real uh, consequence that could come of thinking like that, and that is the murder of Jesus. Then Jesus refused to answer their question about his authority because they failed his test. They had to learn to quit doing whatever it was they were doing in order to find out that Jesus really does have authority, that he has authority to teach, that he's got authority to heal, that he's got authority even to forgive sins. Hint number three, you know that it's time to quit when you find that you've been avoiding whatever it is that God wants you to do. Now, I'm an expert in this field, and when I talk about this, I can I can talk about it with a tremendous amount of confidence because I've been there, done that, got the T-shirt and the coffee mug, The first son in the parable declines that father's request to go work in in the field. He he just flat out says, Lord, I don't want to. And on a very spiritual level, we could say that he's been avoiding what God wants him to do. In my life, I experienced the same thing. I knew knew for ages and ages that, that the call of God was on my life, but, you know, I had other plans. There were other things I wanted to do, and I I. I said no to God more times than I can shake a stick at. And the funny thing about it is that God never really held it against me, never punished me for not doing what he asked him to do. Just like the father in the story here, he let me have my head, you know. But then what we find is that when we drop our resistance, when we get to a point where we change our mind, then we can go and work in the vineyard when we decide that we just simply cannot not do what God calls us to do. Then we're able to drop that resistance of ours and become the people that God would desire for us to be. We face that very same challenge, not just for me, it's for you too. But we don't always get the, we don't always receive clear guidance about uh, how God is going to, how God wants us to work, or where God wants us to work, and uh, we as Christians struggle with that. How to know not only what it is God wants us to do, but where He wants us to do it. And some of the best Christian minds over the, two, the last two thousand years have sought to give us some direction as to uh, some techniques to be able to discern what God's will is in this 
area. And probably one of the best, in my opinion, is that given to us by St. Ignatius Loyola. Uh, Loyola says at first we, we have to clarify our goal in life, and that one goal we have in life, one goal, that goal is to have a loving relationship with God. That's it. And with that goal in mind, keeping it in mind, then we begin to make the kinds of choices that are necessary in order to make that goal happen. Every choice that we make ought to move us closer to the realizing that goal, you see, of being closer to God. You might start a business. You might go back to school. You might get married. You might change jobs. The important thing is that you begin with the goal in mind to follow Christ, and to follow him into an ever more deeper, ever more deep, ever more loving relationship with God. And so once we get that out of the way, once we get that goal clarified, then we can move on to the second stage, and that is tackling all the issues about making decisions. That's where we come to the point where we figure out how we're going to stop avoiding whatever it is that God wants us to do and how we can start working in God's vineyard. Now, a lot of times in life, if we're faced with choices, having to decide between two alternatives or two activities, uh, there are different ways to come to some resolution of that. I, one of the best ways is to make a list, make a list of the pros on one side of the page, a list of cons on the other side of the page, and see which one is longer, shorter, whatever. You can, you can talk with friends of yours about it. You can uh, talk to God, set aside time for prayer and conversation with, uh, with God about it. See if God will give you greater clarity. I've always found that God never is ambiguous. That if, if God truly desires for you to do something, then he is going to make it very perfectly clear to you. I find that in most cases when people are unclear about the direction that God wants them to go in their life, it's that God's been very clear. It's just that they're kind of hanging around hoping that God will have a second opinion, you know. So maybe they won't have to do whatever it was God wanted them to do. Ignatius believed that we can discern the right choice by attending to the inner movements of, of our spirit. God's spirit is in sync with our spirit when we have Christ within us, and it is that spirit that helps us discern what the mind and what the will of God truly is. Now, in my case, what I wound up with was a sense of restlessness. It didn't make any difference what I did, no matter how fulfilling it might have been. I, there was always this sense of restlessness that I had, that I knew that I was not where I should be, and I was not doing what I knew I should do. I had a minister friend who nurtured me through my through my teen years, and even after I even after I grew up, and and I, I did a lot of different things. And I would go visit him and say, "Well, Wes, what are you doing now?" Well, I'm I'm working here, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing. And he would kind of look at me and smile, and he'd say, "Son, you know that that's not what you're supposed to be doing." And I knew that. I knew that. And that restlessness continued for years and years until it built to a point where. Well, I just I had to do something about it one way or another. You reach the point where uh, it's like a nesting hen. You have to deal with it either yes or no. Now, one word of caution here. Uh, there are times when we make decisions about the direction that God would have us go, and we feel very peaceful about them, but we have to be careful that that peacefulness is not just a disguise that it's sort of dis our serenity is a disguise for being lazy. You know, folks who, well, you know, preacher, I'm just kind of waiting on the spirit to move. And uh, usually when I hear that, what that says to me is I'm not really so much waiting for the spirit to move as I am just kind of not going to move out of the ground zero. This little two square foot of pew that I'm sitting on on Sunday morning, again, sort of waiting for that second opinion. The upside of giving up is that it puts us in a position to change our lives for the better. That's really the bottom line here. If we feel that we're avoiding what it is that God wants us to do, then we need to stop what we're doing. It's like going to the doctor and say, Doctor, it hurts when I do this. And the doctor says, well, then you need to quit doing that. If you know that you're doing something that you're not supposed to be, then stop doing it. Clarify your goal. 
Define what it means in your life to have that loving, deep relationship with God. And then figure out what changes need to be made so that you can start using all of your time, all of your talents, all of your energy to work in God's vineyard. That means that we pay attention to those inner movements of the Spirit and we make choices, constant, uh, consistent choices that increase our faith and hope and love. I, I truly believe that God provides us with all the things that we need. But I also believe that God hands us the oars and he gives us the boat and he said, here they are, now you row. He gives us the tools, but there's a lot of it that's up to us. He will move you to that place, but it is up to you to attend to those movements of the Spirit and make those actual changes that are going to increase your faith and your hope and your love. The good news in all of this is that by quitting, you can, in fact, be a winner. And it's always win-win when we choose to follow Christ and move into that more loving relationship with God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, one of the greatest gifts you ever gave us was the gift of free will. You have never forced yourself upon us. You've, uh, you've allowed us to choose whether or not we're going to surrender our will to you and choose Jesus Christ or go our own way. And we know, too, that this choice is a daily one. Will we today choose our own desires or yours? Are we going to run after worldly pleasure or the true joy of knowing Christ? Give us hearts that want to choose you and desire your leading above all else. We are so thankful that you have called us to follow you, and today we choose to obey. What freedom we find in choosing you, we give thanks for, O oh Lord. Amen. My children, this is just a resting place, a place of transit, a place where humanity and God pause before we hit the road again. So go. You're ready to set sail. You are a wayfaring people, never rooted in one place, pilgrims moving toward an abiding city that is further on. Let love be your song, let life be your celebration, for you are the house of God, stones cut according to the measure of God's love. So go, there are people out there waiting for you, and know that God goes with you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.